Hmm? Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of travel announcements. Uh, tomorrow evening, the Secretary General will fly to Brussels, where he will meet with European leaders as well as, well as with Belgium authorities. In his meetings with the European Commission and in a session with heads of state and government of the European Council, the Secretary General will have exchanges on a broad range of issues, including collaboration between the European Union and the United Nations, the promotion of a sustainable, inclusive pandemic recovery based on the Sustainable Development Goals, global access to COVID-19 vaccines, climate and multilateralism. On Thursday, the Secretary General will deliver a solemn address to the European Parliament uh, in Brussels, in which he will reiterate the importance of the partnership between the UN and the EU to address the challenges we collectively face. In Brussels, he is scheduled to have private audience, um, excuse me, later, in, later during the trip in Brussels, he's scheduled to have a private audience with King, uh, with King and Queen of the Belgians, and uh, Queen Mathilde is also, as you may know, a SDG advocate. Uh, the Secretary General will also meet with Belgium's Prime Minister, Alexandre Ducroux, as well as the Deputy uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sophie Vilmes, as well as uh, Marianne Kittier, the Minister for Development Cooperation. And the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Rosemary de Carlo, is traveling to Germany today to lead the UN delegation to the Berlin II Conference on Libya, and that she will do that on behalf of the Secretary General. The meeting aims to take stock of the progress made in the political, security, economic, and humanitarian rights track since the last Berlin meeting, which was held in January 2020. It will also discuss and address the remaining challenges in the implementation of the Libya Political Dialogue Forum Roadmap. And the Secretary General will address the conference via pre-recorded video message, which we will share with you ahead of time. And the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, will represent the Secretary General at the 9th Moscow Conference on International Security, which is taking place from the 22nd to the 24th of June. This event traditionally brings together government representatives, heads of international organizations, and non-governmental experts, among others. Mr. Lacroix will speak at the conference and will share the experiences of peacekeeping operations dealing with the challenges of the COVID-19 while continuing to implement their mandates and support local and national efforts to combat the pandemic. While in Moscow, Mr. Lacroix will hold meetings with senior Russian officials from the Ministries of Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Interior. This will provide an opportunity to thank Russia for its support and contributions to peacekeeping and update on key issues. And back here, the Security Council met in person this morning on South Sudan, briefing the Council with the Secretary General Special Representative, Nicholas Hasem. He noted that on July 9th, the Republic of Sudan will mark its 10th anniversary as an independent state. He said the support of the international community pledge to the country then remains as important today as the world's youngest nation strives for peace, security, and prosperity for its citizens. Mr. Hasem said there has been a progress for the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement, including the official launch of the permanent constitution-making process. He also warned of a pervasive insecurity, in particular intercommunal violence, which continues to obstruct the realization of a durable and sustainable peace in South Sudan. Those remarks were shared with you. And the UN mission in Central African Republic reports that it continues its effort to combat disinformation in the country. The mission recently conducted an awareness-raising workshop for members of civil society and media outlets in Bangui. And the aim of that workshop <coughs> was to fight messages of hatred and incitement to violence on social media. Meanwhile, in Bangasu, uh, the UN mission organized a workshop for 20 participants on good governance of community-based organization and rumor management to better support social cohesion efforts. And ahead of today's election taking place in Ethiopia, you, the Secretary General urged in a statement over the weekend the authorities and the political leaders and their supporters to ensure that all voters are able to cast their ballots freely and peacefully. The Secretary General notes that these elections are taking place in challenging political and security environment. He calls on all stakeholders to refrain from any acts of violence or incitement. The Secretary General encourages leaders and participants in the elections to promote social cohesion and reject hate speech. He stresses that many electoral disputes should be resolved through dialogue and established legal channels. 
And a quick update from Myanmar, where the country team again called for the immediate release of thousands of women and children and men currently in detention almost five months after the military seized control of the government on February 1st. As of today, the number of people arbitrarily addressed, uh, arrested now in detention has topped 5,000, and that's according to the UN Human Rights Office. In addition, nearly 2,000 people, including politicians, authors, human rights defenders, teachers, journalists, healthcare workers, monks, and ordinary citizens remain in hiding due to outstanding warrants for their arrests. In a statement over the weekend to mark the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, the UN Population Fund in Myanmar said that survivors of sexual violence and their families carry the trauma of these heinous crimes. In Myanmar, survivors, including those born of rape, live in shame, stigma, and limited health and social support, and few options to seek legal redress. UNFPA uh, stresses that perpetrators of sexual violence must be held to account and that survivors must be pro provided with prompt, non-discriminatory health care, legal protection, and social protection. And earlier this morning, the Secretary General spoke via pre-recorded video message to the opening of the Ministerial Thematic Forum on High-Level Dialogue on Energy. He said that achieving universal health um, energy, energy is critical for delivering the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Warned that we, he warned that we are running far behind in the race against time to achieve the goal. The milestones are clear, he said, by 2030. We must cut global emissions by 45% compared to 2010 and then continue to net zero, uh, net zero by 2050. He called on every country, city, and financial institutions to comply to raise ambitions and submit energy compacts during the high-level dialogue on energy that will take place in New York on September 20th. He also, also uh, added that the form uh, that, excuse me, also the form today, the IKEA Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation announced they will join forces for a billion dollar global platform to reduce the one billion tons of greenhouse emissions and to provide one billion people with re distributed renewable uh, energy. This renewable energy generated from sources such as mini grid and off grid solutions. Google also announced its energy compact, expanding its own commitment to fully operate 24 seven carbon free energy by 2030. And we also have a um, COVID update for you today from Namibia and Tunisia. Last week, Namibia reported the highest number of confirmed cases ever registered in the country to date. Partial restrictions have been put to, in place for January 14th, for, excuse me, for 14 days until June 30th. Hospitals, including their intensive care units, are at full capacity with supply of oxygen, sadly, uh, of oxygen supply concentrators being of concern. And the UN in Namibia is supporting the country on risk communications to address the spread of misinformation, including over social media and radio, as well as to increase awareness of the vaccine. <clears throat> Tunisia reported the highest COVID-19 mortality rate on the African continent. And our colleagues there tell us that the health system is, in, is under intense pressure with ICU beds being up at 85% occupied and a shortage of oxygen. Currently, 9% of the population has received at least one dose of vaccine. Authorities and the UN team are stepping up the vaccine campaign but are challenged by the limited supply of doses. The UN team has helped to provide hospitals, equipment, and personal protective items, among many others. Um, and I just wanted to add a, uh, that many of us here at the UN uh, were deeply saddened to learn of the death over this weekend of Edward Mortimer. Um, Edward Mortimer served as head speechwriter and director of communications for Kofi Annan uh, during his two terms. As a colleague, we were fortunate to work alongside someone who had a brilliant mind, a way with words, and a ready sense of humor, and who was always collegial and warm. And as a colleague just told me, uh, Edward had limitless uh, talent uh, with words, but he had no ego. For those of you who covered the United Nations during Kofi Annan's tenure as journalist, you will have often have quoted Edward Mortimer's words, no doubt making your stories that much richer. Uh, during a tumultuous period in world affairs, he was a trusted advisor of Secretary General Annan, a passionate defender of the United Nations. 
Edward made an imprint of many of Kofi Annan's signature achievements and initiatives. We're grateful to have worked with him and to have known him, and I know you share my sentiments and join me in offering his sincere condolences to his wife and children. And just lastly, as usual, um, on the budget on Friday, uh, we didn't have a briefing, but I wanted to flag that Uganda had made its budget dues in full, bringing us up to 110. Toby. Thanks, Steph. Hope you had a nice weekend. Um, following the GA resolution, uh, 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 following the GA resolution on Myanmar, uh, which called for an arms embargo and, and various other points uh, uh, condemning the coup, um, we have uh, the, the head of the Tatmada, Minon Lang, who went to Moscow, uh, a, a signal that potentially you know, legitimizes, uh, I think, the, the political situation there. Uh, what is the Secretary General's re reaction to that? And uh, does he think that uh, this goes against what we saw in the GA? Look, the... Um, uh I will leave the analysis of uh, the travels of the head of the Tamido uh, to you and your your colleagues. Um, there was a vote in the General Assembly. Um, I think the, the resolution passed with the overwhelming consent of, uh, of member states. Um, we, we would hope uh, that member states' policies would be guided and reflect uh, what was in the General Assembly resolution. And what does he want for an outcome of that meeting? What, what, he, what, of what, what Which meeting? Of the meeting between uh, the Russian military Look, I, chief I, I, and the... I, I, you know, we're not involved in this uh, meeting. Our, 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 uh, our call uh, would, is and remains for a return to uh, the democratic principles in uh, Myanmar. And I think the Secretary General himself was very clear on that. Uh, when he spoke to you on on Friday, and we would hope that every member state um, speaks with the uh, uh, encourages uh, the authorities in Myanmar in the same direction. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome back. I have a question regarding the Sahil and uh, the Minusma PC operation. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, the head of Minusma addressed the Security Council, as you know. He said, quote, Mali is at a critical juncture, and we cannot allow it to slide into further instability, with drastic consequences for the sub-Saharan region and beyond. So my question now is in the context of what French President Emmanuel Macron said last month. He said they're considering pulling out all the 5,000 troops um, in the Operation Barkane soldiers in the Sahel. So my question is, what would that mean for the municipal operation? I mean, these soldiers are on the front line, 75 French soldiers have been killed over the past few years. And what's, what is this going to do with the, the, the UN municipal strategy well, I mean, we're, to protect we're, civilians? We're, we're aware of uh, the announcement made by, by, by the French. I mean, the, the, the Operation Barakhan and, uh, and MINUSMA have, you know, we could say complementary but very different uh, mandates. MINUSMA will continue uh, to operate. Uh, according to its mandate, and as, as you've seen, there's been absolutely no weakening of its posture, um, especially in the northern uh, in the northern parts, as well as in the uh, the kind of the tri-country area, which has seen such a, a high level of, of violence against civilians. Uh, our call continues to be for the international community to support uh, the people of Mali and the people of the Sahel region uh, to give the G5 Sahel force. Uh, predictable and uh, sustained uh, funding, and we will continue to work in that direction. Okay, uh, James Bays, and then uh, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, sir. Um, has the Secretary General or the Secretariat received a non-paper from the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov about cross-border arrangements in Syria? I'm I'm not aware. Uh, that doesn't mean one hasn't been received, so I will, uh, I will uh, okay. check. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let me just maybe summarize the main point, which is 
He says, we cannot agree with assessments. There's no alternative to the cross-border mechanism in Syria. He goes on to say WFP and uh, the World Health Organization are actively working on cross-line deliveries in Damascus. What is the UN's position on this? Does it believe cross-line could replace cross the one cross-border crossing you've got from Turkey? Look, I, I will reiterate our position. I'm, I'm not responding to the paper, which I haven't seen, though I obviously uh, I have no, no reason to distrust your, uh, your quotes from it, but I, I haven't seen it, so I can't respond to it. We will continue uh, to hope for a, uh, a continuation of the, uh, the cross-border delivery uh, through the Bab al-Awab uh, crossing. It is a critical part of the, the, the lifeline, and, and one can't underscore enough the, the term lifeline uh, for the millions of Syrians uh, who rely on our humanitarian support um, for, daily, for daily survival, almost. I have some other questions if you can come back yeah, to me later. Yes, uh, Abdel Hamid. And then Joe Thank Klein. Thank you, Stefan. I have two questions, one on Libya and one on Palestine. On Libya, this morning, the government of national unity announced the opening of the coastal line. A few hours later, the representative of Haftar uh, forces in the 5 plus 5 group said that was a unilater unilateral decision and the coastal road is closed. The UN was there, and I think they were an eyewitness to that opening of the coastal line. What do you, what you can tell us more about this development in Libya? Well, I can only speak from our, our end that uh, we're in fact encouraged uh, by the strong efforts of the um, of the Five Points Five uh, Joint Military Commission, uh, working with the interim executive authority to ensure that that coastal road that you mentioned is indeed open. And as you know. The reopening of that road is critical uh, to the implementation of the agreements of October 2020, of the ceasefire agreement, including, obviously, and very importantly, the withdrawal of foreign fighters, mercenaries, and other, other forces that need to start without, uh, without further delay. Uh, we continue to intend to support the implementation of the ceasefire agreement, including through a phased deployment of um, uh, phase deployment of um, of unsmil ceasefire monitoring component, uh, as has been authorized uh, by the security uh, the Security Council. And your second question. My second question. If you also follow up, as well, if you tell us the SG will attend the Berlin uh, two conference and as uh, as a piece of information. No. My question is about the meeting today took place in Gaza between Thor Winsland, the UN representative, and the leader of Hamas, Yahya Sinwar. Sinwar, at the meeting, said the meeting was a failure, and he called for a larger meeting with the leaders of the Palestinian faction in Gaza for tomorrow. So what you can tell us from the UN perspective about that meeting? Sorry, what was your, on, on Libya, because I think you also had a, uh, I, just to confirm that the Secretary General will, um, will participate through a pre-recorded video message uh, in, the, uh, in the Libya uh, to conference, and we'll share an advanced text of that uh, for you. Um, okay. all, all I can tell you is that uh, Mr. Venislan was, in fact, uh, in Gaza, and he's continuing his efforts to solidify uh, the cessation of hostilities. But I can't share any more information with you. Okay, Mr. Klein. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, I have two, two questions. One should be fairly easy, the other one a little more complicated. The first one is on COVID-19. You mentioned the Secretary General is gonna be issuing a uh, updated letter on admission uh, eligibility to uh, headquarters building. Um, do you have a more specific date uh, or time frame uh, for when that letter is going to be issued? Uh, not not in this point. My second question that, that should, is that a follow-up. Sorry, that should let me, let, me, let me take the first one. That should be soon. Obviously, uh, various options in terms of the General Assembly were presented to member states. It's now up to those mem to the member states to decide 
or which direction they want to go, but we'll have an update on headquarters hopefully soon. Your second question. Yeah, the second question um, it really follows up on some of what was uh, discussed uh, with Ms. Gamba. And uh, I'd like the Secretary General's uh, comment on the uh, plan by um, uh, Hamas's uh, military wing, Al Qassam Brigades, to uh, have nine year olds through high school students attend a military summer camp. Uh, this summer, uh, and a promotion video that they are showing uh, shows children engaged in uh, marching with guns and falling out of holes, armed with weapons, etc. Uh, so I'd like to know the Secretary General's view on what is obviously recruitment of children uh, in armed conflict and an acknowledgement that Israel has no such uh, child recruitment program. Look, Thank you. I have not, uh, I haven't seen that particular video uh, in terms of child recruitment. I would encourage you to look through the uh, the, the report. Those uh, entities that have active child recruitment uh, are listed and very clearly, and obviously those who don't are not. Um, what is important, and my takeaway from Virginia's uh, presentation is that children everywhere deserve to live in an environment uh, where they are not killed, where they're not maimed, where they're not encouraged to use violence, where they're not used as, as human shields. Um, and that is that was, to me, Virginia Gamba's main uh, message. Okay. Uh, would you agree that the use of summer camp which is, by the way, has been done for several years. It's a matter of public record it, 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 by Hamas. We, we stand against Violence, we stand against person. any encouragement uh, of uh, the use of children in uh, in in armed conflict. Anything that would encourage recruitment of children anywhere around the world, we stand firmly against it. Okay, um, Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Scott. So very sorry to hear about Edward's passing. Deepest condolences. Worked with him as a journalist and when I served the United Nations. Uh, do you know what happened to him? Uh, I, it, would, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, from, from a disease. I mean, you, you, it's listed in the obituary, uh, which you can read in the Financial Times, I think, in other places. Uh, but thank you for those sentiments. Uh, James Bays. Hi, Steph. Um, you have um, a Security Council meeting on Afghanistan coming up in the next 24 hours, and clearly it is a very um, important time in Afghanistan. Number one, um, how concerned is the Secretary General about the security situation right now and potentially then the knock-on for the humanitarian situation? Um, the SRSG, Deborah Lyons, I believe, is rather than Jean Arnaud, is doing the briefing. Um, will she be speaking to reporters? Can we expect a virtual stakeout? These meetings, Afghanistan is not dealt with every month. Yeah. Uh, it's only dealt with quarterly, and it's a vital time for Afghanistan. Will she please place reporters? Yes, we will. Uh, we will ask. Uh, we will ask her. Um, and clearly, one can only be concerned. Uh, by the continuing violence that we're seeing uh, in Afghanistan, and, and, and particularly that the violence that either targets women, that targets uh, religious minorities, and just in general targets uh, civilians. And I have one more question. Um, I'm speaking to you today from London rather than sitting in the room with you, and that's because I haven't received permission to return to New York from the um, US. I will put on record that USUN have been helpful, as has the spokesman's office. Uh, but the wider issue, it's not a self-serving question entirely, um, is there a wider problem with those that work in the building getting permission when they want to travel? Is there a backlog? I believe there is a huge backlog of applications. And what is the UN's view about those who work for the UN and the UN headquarters under the host country agreement, including resident correspondents and their ability to travel. Uh, James, I'm I'm not aware of, of a backlog uh, involving UN 
UN staff wishing to, to come in uh, to, to the US with valid uh, visas. I will check on, uh, on the media uh, aspect. And um, I'm always happy to take your questions, but I would always rather be facing you uh, rather than looking at a large screen TV. So whatever we can get you to, as much as I hate saying this, whatever we can do to make you come back into the briefing room, we will try. I have a question. Yes, Abdel Hamid. Thank you. Uh, regarding the elections in Iran, did the Secretary General send a congratulations message to President uh, Raisi? And was there any statement regarding the elections in general, as all of the UN uh, does when there are elections anywhere in the world? Thank you. No, I mean, the. Um you know, we've taken note of the announcement by the electoral authorities uh, in Iran that Ibrahim Raisi is the winner of the electoral uh, the elections of uh, June 18th. Um, the Secretary General looks forward to the continued cooperation with the Iranian authorities on issues of mutual respect for the benefit of Iran and the people and of uh, the region. Um, the usual process uh, will be followed, I have no doubt, uh, but that's usually closer to the time of inauguration, which, as far as I understand, is about six, uh, at least six weeks from now. Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, and I'm going to get some lunch because I'm starving. Thank you all. See you tomorrow.